today's, in today's episode of the Audiophiliac is a bit different. Yes, today I'm here at Hi-Fi Loft in New York City to spend some quality time listening to these speakers. These are Klipsch Jubilee, the new flagship of the Heritage line from Klipsch. The Klipsch Jubilee is long in coming. It, it was actually originally supposed to come out in 1996. Well, for the 50th anniversary of the company, uh, things just didn't come together. So here it is, finally, in 2022, for the 75th anniversary of Klipsch. Still based in Hope, Arkansas, where they built all of their heritage speakers, and they always have, and that's where this one is built. Now, it's a two-way design with a uh, two 12-inch woofers uh, in a specially vented cabinet and a very large horn, <laughs> a very, very large horn. And the driver for that horn is a seven inch titanium dome uh, with a five inch voice coil. And that horn handles all frequencies above 340 Hertz. The woofers go down to 18 Hertz. The minus three D point is 18 Hertz. The bass, I will tell you right up front, spoiler alert, the bass is extraordinary. Now it's huge, and I'm gonna put up the complete specs right now, but it, this room that I'm in is not very big, so it actually works well in not gigantic rooms. Of course, it will work well in very large rooms, but I'm just amazed. I had my doubts that they would actually work in this room. I thought it was too small. It's not. Now, as I said, I'm here at Hi-Fi Loft in New York City, and I originally thought that these speakers were on loan from the company for a limited run of, you know, do some press things and some customers. But it turns out Jason, who owns the store, told me that these speakers are here uh, for the duration. They're not going anywhere. So that's amazing because there's not that many places you can hear these speakers, certainly no other places in or anywhere near New York City. So that is great news. I can, I'm going to come here a lot and listen to these speakers because I just had the best time listening to them. And by the way, th this speaker has been in the making for a very long time, and I did an in-depth interview with the designer Roy Delgado earlier this year for my podcast. So to get the full background of the history of this speaker and how it all came together, check out the podcast, and I will link to that directly below. Oh, and as for the price, I will tell you this right up front, it is $36,000 a pair. Now that's a lot of money. But considering how big it is and the quality of it and that it's made in the USA, that does not seem at all unreasonable. Now, of course, if you can't stretch it to 36,000, well, the closest speaker to this one would be the Klipsch Horn, the speaker that, the very first speaker from the company that debuted in 1946. I'm gonna do a pan around the room to just give you the lay of the land here and I'm gonna put up still pictures of the electronics which are made by Lab 12, company I reviewed their smallest amp, the Mighty, a few months ago here on this channel. Really good stuff, it's made in Greece, it's exceptional. And also a Macintosh CD player was the source for all of my music selections over the course of this review. Now, should I say review? I don't know, it's not really a review, it's really more listening impressions. It can't be as in-depth as an actual review in my home. And by the way, yes, they were offered to me to be delivered to my home by Clips. But if I had it in my house, which would be amazing, I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't fit in anything else to review because they would be in this spot. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. Now, I have lived with Clips Cornwall 4s for three years. I think, I thought I knew the sound of Clips horns. But listening to these speakers... No, this is a whole different thing. I mean, the first thing I can tell you is they don't sound like horns. There's nothing uh, horny about the sound. Nothing. Not, and I mean nothing. My friend Herb Riker, who goes back much further than me with horns or experiences with a lot of horn speakers, he said, the bigger the horn, <laughs> the less they sound like horns. And I think that that's, that's true, based on my experiences today. 
there's just an ease to it. I was going to use the word effortless, but that's too easy. It's more than that. There's like a seamless, yeah, effortless. I'll go with effortless for now, but I'm going to come up with some better adjectives in due time. But I'm sitting here listening to these speakers and thinking, they don't sound like horns. They certainly don't sound like box speakers. They're extremely dynamic. They're extremely powerful. But there's more to it than that. Oh, so I just want to say, having lived with the Cornwalls for three years, that one of the best things about I can say about Cornwalls is that they play quiet so well. Late, late night, three o'clock in the morning, I get up, I want to listen to some music. I can and not disturb my, my wife or my neighbors. And I don't feel this desire to play them louder to connect with the music. These speakers, they're big. You think they play loud and that's what they're all about. No, they play quiet really well. I would say most of my listening time today wasn't trying to it blow me away. I didn't need to. I didn't need to play them loud to feel it and to be so impressed by what they can do. I had, to. you know, when I was picking out CDs to bring to this uh, event today for me, my private audience with the Jubilees, I, you know, I was picking really good sounding recordings that I worked on for Chesky Records and MA Recording. I was picking out really good sounding recordings because I wanted to hear what these speakers could do. But I also brought Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin II. Now, Led Zeppelin, I love Led Zeppelin. I grew up with Led Zeppelin. But it doesn't sound good on audiophile systems, on high-end systems. The recordings are just too distorted and not the good kind. It's just compression is a bit much. There's a lot of, a lot of things not to like about the sound of Led Zeppelin. But amazingly enough, they sounded, Led Zeppelin II sounded great here. I mean, I am shocked that this could happen. I don't understand why it's happened. It's some kind of magic that lets this music come through these speakers loud, and I'm not cringing or saying, uh, I gotta turn it down. No, <laughs> it sounded great. It sounded so good. Jimmy Page's guitar, the distortion, the good kind, was just beautiful. Robert Plant's vocals, wow. I mean, that guy's range, his vocal, I mean, whew, wow. John Paul Jones' bass and keyboards. And of course, John Bonham's drums, those incredible things that he did on drums that no one ever heard before John Bonham was sitting behind that kid on a rock record. Wow. Yeah, so I was digging it. I couldn't, like I said, it's, I, I did not see that coming. I did not think that this was even possible, that Led Zeppelin would sound good on a true high-end system. It didn't sound good, it sounded great. So how do I follow Led Zeppelin? I followed Led Zeppelin with a true audiophile recording made by David Johansson for Chesky Records. I was present at the session. Now David Johansson, in case you don't know, was in the New York Dolls, if that means anything to you. But anyway, he's a great rock singer, but this is kind of a blues record that he made here. And it was done live to two track, meaning there's no overdubs or fixing in the mix, uh, no dynamic range compression, no equalization, just a band playing in a church, St. Peter's on 20th Street in New York City. So we're, here, we're using the room. I was present, I was working at that session. Yeah, so the reverb, we didn't need any artificial digital or analog reverb. We had a church, natural reverb, and you hear it on this recording. You hear it on any decent system. But hearing it over the Jubilees, yeah. And the imaging is unusually precise and focused, and the spaces between the musicians and David Johansson were so beautifully rendered. There's nothing hard about this speaker. There's nothing bright edgy or aggressive, none of those things. And yet the symbols can sound super detailed and shimmer and the metallic quality of symbols were fully present over this speaker. And I'm thinking, but it doesn't sound right. There's nothing boosted or hyped about the sound. And yet when there's a lot of high frequency information, it just, it's just there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to repeat myself. They don't sound like horn speakers. It's just, I'm sitting here listening and I'm looking at the big horn. These are big. Uh, and I don't, 
hear horn, anything horn, horniness coming from the sound. They disappear. It's weird to think that something this big can disappear like these do. But they do. They just do. So then I played this uh, recording by my friend Todd Garfinkel. Uh, it's on MA Recording. I will link to it below. And it's by Mark Youssef, and it's recorded in Japan. And Mark is a percussionist. And he's got a lot of toys and big drums and they go deep, deep, deep. So it's not so much really about impact. It's about going down low, which is why I brought this recording along. And you, again, you feel like the presence of a very large drum, which is not about necessarily impact. He's playing with, with subtlety. He's playing with dynamics and that shading of each uh, drum hit, each thwack so well rendered, the beater against the skin of the drum, amazing. And on one track, there's a big cymbal that's on a, you know, hanging from ropes and stuff, and it turns, and you hear this weird phasing effect. It sounds like a studio effect, but it's actually the way it sounds in real life when you hear it moving around. It was so, so beautiful, the harmonics coming off that symbol were extra or gong, I should say, were, were extraordinary. So, you know, last night I had a tough time sleeping. I kept waking up, I was tossing and turning, and uh, I, I, at five o'clock in the morning, I just couldn't go back to sleep. So I just started working on other things, other projects. But I'm thinking, what will the Jubilees sound like? Well, they sound like, well, big Cornwalls, <laughs> bigger with more bass and more. Mm, you know, or will they sound like clips horns, which I know a little bit. I don't have that much experience. But no, this is its own thing. It's a completely different animal. It's taken a long time to get here, from 1996 to 2022, and now it's here. And yeah, it's expensive, I'm sorry. But <laughs> for what it is, it's not expensive. And of course, you can find uh, other Klipsch Heritage speakers are out there from Heresy to Forte to Cornwall to La Scala to Klipschhorn and now the heavyweight champion, the Jubilee. They are out there to fit your budget. So my thanks go out to Hi-Fi Loft, to Jason and Michael that made this possible today. Thank you so much for giving me the run of the store. Now, they, they told me to tell you that they are Klipsch Heritage dealers, so they do sell the smaller Klipsches, and they work by appointment. So uh, I will link to their website below. But yeah, I am amazed. I, like I said, I thought these, the Jubilees were only going to be here for a limited time, and then they were going to go bye-bye. But in fact, they're going to be here for quite some time. And that makes me happy that at least every now and then I could pop in and listen to them. If you like what I'm doing here on the channel, please hit the like button. Please subscribe. And if you really like what I'm doing here on the channel, please consider joining my Patreon. The address is on the screen right now. And payment is accepted in dollars, pounds, and euros. And I will mention, you can start for just a couple of bucks a month, up to 50 or $100 at the top tier. You and I can have conversations every month at the beginning of the month which I so enjoy doing. It's so nice to talk to you people out there rather than just being um, my imagination of who you are. I get to know you through, these, through the Patreon, and I think that's fantastic. And at the lower prices, if you email me a question, I'm way more likely to get to you if you're a patron than if not. So there's, there's always that. And with that, I can say my work here is at last complete. Oh. Yes, I do have a Cobuzz playlist that is four and a half hours long of my favorite music of the last few months. If you have Cobuzz, check it out. If you don't, I someday will get my act together and do playlists for Tidal and Spotify and others. But right now, it's Cobuzz only. So anyway, if the link to it is below. That's it. That's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did making this video. And I hope you come back again real soon.